thank you for this opportunity we have to come before you this morning and rejoice. Because this is the day that you have made. And we need to make a decision to rejoice in it no matter what happens through it. As long as we give our life over to you, Father. There might be obstacles, there might be things that come up against us, but you said you would never leave us and you would never forsake us. As we enter into your word today, Father, I pray that your spirit will bring revelation to us. In Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen. 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 Turn with me to Exodus chapter 33. The title of this morning's message is The Promise of His Presence. I'm glad that uh, I'm glad for His presence, aren't you? Yeah. Amen. Yes. His presence just seems to have a way of, of helping us get through stuff, yeah. doesn't it? It's like, uh, it's like so many people today, they, they've uh, gone through situations or whatever, and they uh, turn their back on God because God isn't moving fast enough for them. Mm-hmm. Well, the issue is, if you don't give God an opportunity to work in your life, you're going to miss out on Him anyway. Right? So we have to make a choice. We have to make a choice to walk in His presence because His presence wants to be with us. Amen? Exodus chapter 33. Now, I'll read a few excerpts, but my message is going to be from 12 to 16. But let's just read chapter 33, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up to the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your descendants I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Pesarite, the Havite, the Jebusite, Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst. Kind of frightening, isn't it? I will not go up in your midst because of what you did before. Remember a few chapters before is the calf issue. Remember Moses went up and got the Ten Commandments, came down and worshipped some silly calf. So God says, I'm not going to go with you because you are an obstinate people. Yeah, God uses words like that. You are an obstinate people, and I might destroy you on the way. When the people heard this sad word, they went to mourning, and none of them put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Say to the sons of Israel, You are an obstinate people. Should I go up with you in the midst for one moment? Why in the world would I go with you when you're an obstinate people? And don't forget, these are God's people. We are God's people, are we not? Yes. We don't want to be called obstinate, but sometimes we make ourselves obstinate because we don't, we don't make a choice not to be obstinate. Not to look on God as, the, as He deserves to be looked upon. For the Lord had said to Moses, Say to the sons of Israel, You are an obstinate people. Should I go up with you in the midst of one moment? For one moment? I will destroy you. Now, therefore, put off your ornaments from you, that I may know what I shall do with you. So the sons of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Herod onward. So all through the next trek, they heard these words, You are an obstinate people. And then sometimes they probably had to be reminded, Why is God calling you obstinate? Why has God turned His face on you? Why does God have to separate himself from you? Because you're an obstinate people. That's what he's telling Moses. And look at verse 12. Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you, you say to me, bring up this people. But you yourselves have not let me know whom you will send with me for moreover. You have said, I have known you by my name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Moses is pleading with God. God, these are your people. Yeah, they made a mistake. They goofed up. But they're your people. And he says this, Now therefore I pray you, if you have found favor in your, if I have found favor in your sight, let me know your ways, that I may know you. Let me know your ways, that I may know you. Lord, I need to understand your ways so I can know you better. So that I may find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence shall go with you and I will give you rest. Then he said to him, if your presence does not go with us, 
Do not lead us up from here. Several times Moses said, if you're not going to go with us, God, we don't want to go. Isn't that the way we should be? God, if you're not going to go with us, we don't want to go. If you're not going to move, we don't want to do anything. If you're not going to, if, if the Holy Spirit isn't going to direct us, we don't, we don't want it. We want to do what you want to do. We want to move the way you want to move. Verse 16. For how then can it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Moses said, if you don't go with us, how, how are we going to know that we have found favor? You know, I'm not really sure anybody else in history has ever sat down and talked to God that way. Moses had a freedom, didn't he? But I got news for you today. The Holy Spirit lives in you. Jesus Christ lives in you. You can talk to God just the way Moses did. And the thing is, what the difference is, 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 is through the power of the Spirit and the anointing of the Spirit, God's listening. Before Jesus, he couldn't even look upon you. He couldn't look upon sin. Before Jesus, he couldn't even look upon you. It is not by your going with us so that we, I, and your people may be distinguished from all other people who are upon the face of the earth. If you don't go with us, God, how are we going to be set? How are we going to be distinguished? A great promise from a great and faithful God is a great and precious privilege. Would you agree? If we let God speak, His word will without a doubt be filled in our lives. You notice what I said here. If we let Him speak, if we give Him an opportunity to speak into our lives, He has given us exceeding great and precious promises. Just read the Word. Read the Word. He's given you promises. And by these promises, we are partaker, partakers of the divine nature, of God's divine nature. Turn with me to 2 Peter 1 4, or just write it down and go through it later. 2 Peter 1 4. <clears throat> I'm going to start with verse 3. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence, for by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. God has given you his nature so you can escape the things of the world. He's given you promises and promises and promises and promises that he cannot take back. The many promises of our bankrupt human nature are no value. How many people in your life has made you a promise that never came true? Or if it was a half a promise. Or maybe if you do this, I'll do this. If you take care of this, Johnny, I'll do this for you. My stepdad used to promise me drum kits and mini bikes and all kinds of stuff if I do this. Never happened. Human nature, human bankrupt promises are no value. God tells us that his presence will go with us and it will give us rest, verse 14. His presence will go with us and give us rest. You know what? Moses is speaking prophetically. Not only did God go with Moses in the wilderness, but in the New Testament, because of what Jesus accomplished and the Holy Spirit came, he goes with us every step we take, every breath we take, he's with us. And what do we do sometimes? You know what, God, you, you sit right here and if I need you, I'll let you know. That's a pretty harsh thing to say, isn't it? But how true is it? God, you know what? I don't need you right now, but, but when I need you, I'll let you know. And you know what God says? He takes a back seat to your choice. Okay, when, when you're ready for me, I'll be here. I'm not going to leave you, but I'll be here. Look how easy it was for Moses to change God's mind. If you don't go with us, God, we ain't going. But you're an obstinate people. Because of what you did, 
What you did all the way since I've released you from Egypt's hand. You look what you've accomplished. You even brought some of the, the gods from, their, from them out and into your tents. And I told you not to. But all through the Bible, all through the word of God, God shows up. God shows up. How was this promise sought? Verse 12 tells us. Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people. Bring up this people. The promise was sought. Then in the face of a great commission, when Moses heard, bring up my people, bring up this people, the promise was, was sought. In the middle of a great commission, in the middle of God's asking Moses to do something that if you would look at it, fleshly was impossible to do. Think about it. Moses goes into Egypt. Walks into the camp of the Israelites and says, hey, uh, God's called you out of this place. Where's your army? <laughs> the staff. Have you, ever, have you ever asked God, where's your army? How are you going to deliver me from this? And it's in the Holy Spirit. says, I got it. I got it. I can do it. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. But we forget that sometimes. How can Moses bring up his people without the powerful guiding presence of a sustaining God? God sustained Moses. God sustains us each and every day. If the enemy comes to you and tries to bring you back what God has brought you out of, seek help. If someone's trying to declare to you, look, you're the same person you were before Jesus, seek help. Call someone. I've said this every Sunday for months. Call someone. I need your help. I don't want to go backwards. I want to continue going forward. God's promises are yes and amen. God's presence is the sustaining power in your life. It has been said that God's biddings are his enablings. Think about that for a minute. When God bids you or asks you to do something, now you're thinking, okay, how am I going to do this? It enables you to accomplish what he's called you to do unless he gives you the power to do it. How am I going to do this, God? Just take the first step. God, how am I going to bring all these people out of Israel? Take the first step, Moses, and know this. I'm going to go with you. Can you imagine the script that Moses must have had? Threw down the stake and the, the saucers threw the two, two more stakes down became stakes. Moses stick ate the other two sticks. How about that? God, I guess you are my present. <laughs> Every time Moses tried to set God's people free, something came up. But God was faithful. God gave Moses a commission, gave him the ability, but it also enabled him to do it. He couldn't do it on his own. But he had to do it under the power of God. Sometimes we, we go through communion services. Sometimes, and I don't mean this negatively or, or whatever, but sometimes we take it too lightly. We take communion service too lightly. We take what Jesus done for us too lightly. If we were to sit long enough on our knees or on our face or whatever and say, God, show me, reveal to me what these emblems actually mean. And then run for cover. I'll tell you why. Because the Holy Spirit will show you what these emblems mean if you're ready to hear them. If you're ready to be revealed. Aren't you glad today that Jesus suffered a, a suffer that you don't have to suffer? He suffered something that you and I deserve. And those emblems represent that. Those emblems also represent what Moses accomplished through the power and the promise of God. The assurance that God gave Moses, I will set your people free. Moses, you won't do it. And I got news for you, Moses. The Pharaoh won't do it either. But I'll do it. Are you walking in something today that you don't see no end to? That you don't see no light through the, the tunnel? You don't see no, no way for it to... Uh, to transpire, no way for it to get set free in your life. Or is anybody in here like that? If none of you come up against an obstacle, then I want to see perfect tattooed on your head next time. <laughs> we all go through stuff. Yes, we do. Amen? And we will go through stuff until we hear those words. Well done. But God is with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. 
He will always give you. If he's asked you to do something, he will give you the ability to accomplish what he's asked you to do. His presence is always associated with his commands and his demands. Commands and demands, how many know they're different? A command is basically, you know, go and do this. A demand is you will go and do this. You don't have a choice. That's right. When we come to the cross, guess whose choice that is? Ours. We don't have to. No, we don't have to. We don't have to accept what Jesus did. We can walk around this world like we own the place. We can do whatever the world asks us to do to make the light shine in them. The world light, not God's light. But when we make that choice, we need to walk around and understand that we've been redeemed. We've been set free from sin and death. We are no longer in bondage to that stuff. But we still walk around. Woe is me. Woe is me. My washer blew up today. Woe is my... Woe is my new one. Woe is me. Hey, you know what? God can supply a washer. I know. That's why I said pray for a God can supply a new car. Yes, he can. God can supply anointed mailbox. God can supply cash. We never thought cash was possible to come from, especially when you get something from the IRS that you never expected. <laughs> we all have that happen, except the IRS, we have that. God is your supply. Man's not your supply. I remember when Prothco closed up. They all said, oh, we're so sorry about this, John. And my, my response was this. You're not my supply. God is my supply. Amen. Now, it took years to get there. Amen? We are confidently, we may confidently ask and expect. And there's one for you. Expect all sufficiency to meet every need in doing His will. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Don't you just love the word? I do. Sometimes I'll sit in my little office at home and I'll just look at the word and just I want to share something with me. And like this morning I walked in my room and, and my little office there and my wife come up, she said, What are you doing? I said, I'm reading the word. Sometimes you just need that little extra oomph. Amen. What did I say? Second Corinthians chapter nine, verse eight. It says this. Now read verse seven. Each one must do just as he has purpose in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have abundance for every good deed. We are all sufficient in God. God has met every need. That's a promise we can take to the bank. That's a promise that His presence is with us. He will supply all of our needs. And it doesn't always mean financially needs either, folks. You know what God's mostly interested in? I don't, you know, whenever you listen to the, the, you know, the, whatever those guys are called nowadays, the, the whatever, but you know what God's mostly interested in, in you? is to be all sufficient in your spiritual walk and your growth and His grace and His joy. Isn't that what Paul says? When I am weak, you are strong. Yeah. He is all sufficient. What this promise offered, verse 14, let's read it again. And He said, My presence shall go with you and I will give you rest. My presence shall go with you who is unable to unpack? Who can take all this stuff out of suitcases? Who can take all this out of a garbage bag? These few words. These few words. It's hard to unpack all of it. It's hard to say, my presence will go with you everywhere. How do you unpack that? How do you, how do you take that out of your suitcase? How do you take that out of your out of your How do you do that? His promises are yes and amen. His presence is, will go with us all. All the treasures of earth and the oceans may be exhausted. Stuff might run out. But all the demands and needs of redeeming humanity will never in time or eternity be able to diminish in any degree the riches contained in that verse. Few little words. Few little words. My presence shall go with you. If you have nothing, His presence is still with you. 
He is your all-sufficient one. He will supply where you don't think there's supply coming from. You could go through your purse or wallet on one day and, man, where'd that come from? You know what, folks? God can make money appear from nothing. Amen. Amen. It happens. It happens, doesn't it? Living proof right here. God can make it come from nothing. But you know what? What's important, more important than that, I think, is God can produce inside of you a desire to know him closer, to walk with him closer, to walk with him, I'm going to say better. The Bible says we've all fall short of the glory of God. That's right. Amen? Amen. We have a promise from God himself. And I think we take that lightly too sometimes. We have a promise from God himself. God himself has promised us to go with you. In Matthew 28, 20, it says this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Didn't he mean to get lightly or we just mean to take it for granted? We take it for granted and lightly. Yeah, okay. I was thinking lightly. We take it for granted that, you know what, really God, can we take it lightly? God, can you, I'm going to go, will you meet me halfway? Yeah. If I supply this, will you supply this? And God simply says, I want all of you. Let me supply all of it. But we think we can outdo God by just doing part of it. God says, no, I want it all. I want all of you. I don't want some of you just on Sunday morning. I want it all. But tomorrow... Or even this afternoon, the enemy will throw something in your face and you'll think, oh God, where are you at? <laughs> this presence can only be made real to us by the indwelling, the infilling of the Spirit of God. That's the only way it becomes a revelation to us. Is that the Spirit of God brings us to a point of, a point of understanding, of revelation. Isn't that what Jesus said? I'm going to send you a comforter. I'm going to send you a re the revelator. I'm going to send you the Spirit. So the Spirit will bring us to a, an understanding of what that means for the presence of God to be with us always. Amen? Amen? Just as the sun's influence is made real through the atmosphere, we can see the sun's influence. We can see what the sun does. Go out in the sun in the summertime. You'll get a sunburn, won't you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, the, but God's influence, His presence is with you always. And His presence is with you, and it shows up in your fruits. Right? It shows up in what you are doing for God. Faith without works is dead. But you can't do works without faith. And your faith will produce a works that glorifies God. Amen? Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Because if you grieve the Holy Spirit, the door closes against His gracious presence. Understand this for a minute. Old Testament, Moses... The Spirit was roaming around. Right? Whenever God needed something accomplished, or Samuel, or Moses, or anything else, the Spirit would show up. He lives in us. He lives and dwells in us. Don't grieve Him. As the glory filled the holy place, so His presence filled you. Old Testament, you read about the tabernacle. His glory filled the whole place. His presence fills you the same way. When was this promise given? It was given in answer to a cry and desire that was infinitely pleasing to God. Moses said, I pray you show me your glory. Have you ever prayed for God to show you his glory? Read verse, read verse 18 for me. Verse 18 says this. Then Moses said, I pray you show me your glory. And he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. But verse 20 says, but you can't see my face. Aren't you glad today that when the Holy Spirit brings you into revelation, you can feel and sense and see God's face because of what he's doing in you? I'll be honest with you, folks. I would hate to be wandering around the desert for 40 years. I would hate to make... To, you know what? I have a lot of sense today. I can't do a pigeon. i got to do a full-blown bull. That's what they had to do. But your sins have been wiped off the map. If you've asked Jesus in your heart to become your Savior and been washed with your blood, you are no longer sinless before God unless you continue in it. The promise was given when Moses made a plea. 
Those who seek to know him will know him and rejoice. Have you ever been down the dumps and you're seeking him and you're looking toward him and you're praying and you're praising him and all of a sudden you're, oh man, I feel better. As long as the devil can keep you wallowing in the mud, you won't feel better. As long as the enemy keeps you down, you won't feel better. There's people we all know in this room here today that are going through absolute hell because they made a choice. They made a choice. They made a choice to come out from the covering that God has promised. God said he will tuck you under, the, under my wings. Those who seek him will know him and rejoice. He delights to manifest. He wants to manifest himself to us. He wants to make his presence shown to us. He wants, he's eager and honest to, to show himself to devoted people. Are you, are you with me this morning? Are you understanding that the presence of God is the most important thing we could ever do? Or ever have? I like this. The pure in heart will see God. The pure in heart will see God. What do you mean by that? The pure in heart will see God. Those that aren't hiding anything. Those that aren't angering against anybody. Those that have an honest desire to seek God and to follow God and have a relationship with God. That's a sincere heart. That's a heart that's crying out, Lord, you know what? I deserve death. But because of you, I have life. And Lord, I don't deserve your presence. But you make your presence known. I'm a sinner saved by grace. Your grace has allowed me to have a relationship with you. Why in the world would I want to snuff that off? Lord, you're, you know, as long as things are going good in my life, me and you, we're tight. But as soon as things start going haywire, you know what? I'm going to look for another option. How many of you have been there? I've been there. Lord, this ain't working. You, you know what? This ain't working. I'm going to find something else. And God says, fine, you take three or four steps down this road, and three or four steps down this road. You turn around, he said, you're going, okay, come on. We've all been through stuff, but God will never leave you. His presence, he wants to give you. He wants, he's eager and honest to devoted people with pure hearts to be in his presence. He wants to be with you. He wants to pour water upon those who are thirsty. Thirsty for his presence. Thirsty for his presence. Lord, I'm thirsty for you. I want more of you. Is it possible, Lord, to have all of you? Probably not now. But when we get in our glorified body, we'll have all of him. But what our spirits are able to... Now, remember this. Your spirit's a lot bigger than you. Your spirit can handle more God than your flesh can. Does that make sense? Paul says, you've got to die to flesh every day. If you don't die of flesh, the spirit just becomes weaker and weaker and weaker. The spirit himself does become weaker, but the spirit in you becomes weaker. He will pour water upon those who are thirsty for his presence. How often, how often do we cry for blessings instead of for God? Lord, bless me. Bless me with this. Bless me with this. If you do this, I'll do this. Lord, I want your blessings. When it should be, God, I want you. And then whatever blessings you see to give me, thank you. But I want you first and foremost. We make, we make, there's nothing wrong with saying, God, if I will. What the problem is, if God, if you don't, I won't. Because God will do what you ask. And didn't that Jesus tell you? Whatsoever you ask in my name of the Father, he will do it. But there's a thing about sincerity that comes in. Remember the rich young ruler? What do I need to do to have to be born again, to be saved? What did Jesus tell him? Go sell all your stuff and give it to the poor. Oh, wait a minute. That, you know, I can't do that. Remember that story? Jesus told him all about the Ten Commandments first. Do this, love your neighbor, all that stuff. Uh, I do all that from a young age. Jesus, well, you know what? You need to go sell your stuff. Jesus was testing his resolve. It isn't that Jesus wanted to go be poor. 
Jesus was testing his resolve. Are you willing to do this? Are you willing to give everything up for me? Are you willing for my presence? God himself is to be the joy of our hearts. Not the joy we see in the world. But the joy that can only come from knowing Jesus. Jesus said, come into my joy. Come into my presence. Come into my joy. And we say, joy, what does that mean, Lord? We will never know what his joy is unless we come into his presence. It's like, it's, it's like the, the glory cloud. I don't know if you've ever experienced the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but I'll tell you what. It's happened several times here, and you can just feel that wave go back. And you can just feel God doing and God moving and God doing things. Not in a freakish way. Not in a terrifying way. But in a presence way. Amen? The way into the fullness of blessing is not by seeking blessing, but by seeking God. Show me that I may know you, Jesus tells us in John 17, 3. Show me so I need you. Life eternal is that we may know him. That's life eternal, that we know him. Without knowing him, we won't have life eternal. You see what Moses was going through? His presence. God was promising Moses his presence. Just like God, through Jesus, God the Son has promised us his presence. How many of you in this room, you don't have to raise your hands, have been beat up this week? How many of you have been beat up this week? The devil said this just like Tim was talking about this morning. Now, what Tim was talking about was a good thing, wasn't it? God speaking to us, right? Yeah. But Isaiah also talks about the little moth. That's constantly bickering in your ear. Do you really? Can you? You, you did that all the time. But the way we accomplish that eradication is to say, no, I'm walking in God's joy. I'm walking in Jesus' joy. You get away from me, enemy. But so many times we forget that God has us in the palm of his hand. So whatever the devil tells us, we walk that way instead of the right way. Folks, time is too short. Time is too short to get in the other line. Matthew chapter 7. Time is too short to get in the other line. And Jesus tells us that, that you'd be surprised on who makes it and who don't make it. Can you look around you right now and think, you know what, I know what you're talking about. I know what you're talking about. That's the word, folks. God says through his word that some think they will make it that won't make it. Why? It's because the presence of God isn't with them to bring them on a trail of obedience, to bring them on a trail of, of God. Is this what you want me to do? It's time for God's people to quit half-heartedly following Him. It's time for God's people that when the tolling gets tough, you don't bail. You stand up or kneel or whatever God has you do. Wednesday night we had a uh, a teaching, fantastic teaching. Yes. Chris did a phenomenal job. Yes. Chris has got anointing of teacher on her. But in that teaching, we realized she's beginning to point out who we are. Who we are. Can you imagine being in a, a pit? And the voice of God says, Hey, Gideon, come on out of that pit. Really? But I'm in the pit. Holy Spirit tells you the same thing. Come on out of that pit. I got something for you. God, be sure I'm the least of all these things. Know what? You're not. You're on the front line. You're on the front row. And you might surprise you a little bit, but you're seated with Jesus on the right hand of the Father. Isn't that what the Bible says? The Bible says he was resurrected where he took a seat on the right hand of the Father, and we are there with him. That's who we are in Christ. It's time for God's people to begin walking in, 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 in victory, not defeat. Life eternal is the way we may know him. And not only life, but love, joy, peace, and power. Love, joy, peace, and power. How many of you give love to get something back? How many of you know people that give love to get something back? I'll love you, but you know what? You're going to do this for me. No. That isn't God love. God says, I will. God's love is, I will do whatever I need to do, regardless of what you do for me. 
And God's peace is this. The peace that surpasses all understanding because of his revelation to me who peace is. Jesus is peace. The world is at peace. I'm not peace. You're not peace. The spirit in you brings peace because of what Jesus did. So the next time your neighbor wants to turn on you and clash over you, you know what I have? The peace of Jesus. What's that song the kids used to say? Down deep in my soul or something like I that. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Hallelujah. Well, you know what's really unique about joy and love, peace and all that stuff is what he gives us besides that. Power. Power. Divinely given power to be an overcomer. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not carnal. They're divinely powerful for bringing down strongholds. What's a stronghold? Anything in your life that's keeping you to be fulfilled in God is a stronghold. And the enemy brings them on you every day. You might have had a neighbor that you drove by one time and got in a big riff with him and had a big conversation. Not so good. The anger thing came out. What's your response? Oh, man. That was wrong. What do you do about it? You know, I'm sorry you acted that way. Would you forgive me? Hey, no, I ain't meant to Fine. I know Jesus forgives me. You don't have to forgive me. But I ask you forgiveness. Yeah, at least you apologize. Amen? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'll forgive you if you bring me 14 cords of wood and, and clean out my trough and yeah. clean out my... <laughs> I don't know if I mention that. When I was a kid, I had to do that, and that wasn't pretty. What this promise brought. In the presence of an earthly great person manifest distinctions among men. Have you ever been in the presence of someone that people call great? And he demands. He demands just by his presence. He demands the, 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 the extinction that he's this great dude. Yeah. Yeah. You've been there? Yeah. Just because who I am. You know what? You need to bow down to me. That's, that's who I am. Oh, I know. I know. And Jesus said, the only one you bow to, the only one you break your knee for is God himself. Amen. Jesus always pointed to the Father. Hey, don't give glory to me. Everything that I say comes from the throne room. It's not my words, it's his words. Even though Jesus, 100% man, 100% God, he gave glory to who needs and has to have the glory. Amen. Not that he needs it. The presence Earthly great persons can manifest distinctions. They want you to bow down to them. But we can expect that presence of God will also bring distinguishing marks upon us. The distinguishing marks upon us in His presence that we bow down to Him. The distinguishing marks, the evidence of grace. Verse 16. I put my glasses on. Verse 16. For how then can it be known that I have found favor in your sight? I and your people. Is it not by your going with us so that we, I and your people, may be distinguished from all the other people who are upon the face of the earth? His grace has found favor. We have found favor in God's eyes because of grace. Not the kind of grace that allows us to continue in sin. Because Paul says, shall we continue in sin so grace may abound? What's he say? Mm -hmm. no. no. God forbid. That's just what he says. So, folks, grace isn't, grace isn't something that you can use to get out of jail. It's not a get out of jail free card. Grace will cover a multitude of sins. Amen? Amen? But the type of grace that we hear about all the time is if you continue, God's faithful enough to forgive you. You need to make a step saying, I'm not going to go that way again. And if I fail, God's grace will cover me. But it's when we blatantly do what we don't, what we know we're not supposed to do that God's grace says, you know what? I love you, but hey, you're making a decision. God's grace can cover it all. But we need to be obedient. Yeah. I have found favor in your sight, Moses is saying. I and your people walking in the enjoyment of his, of his presence implies that we may live in the fullness of his grace. Uh, in his presence. His grace is made sufficient for us while his presence is going with us. How are we going to do this? How are we going to accomplish this? Well, you're not. God in you will. Have you, have you got any family members that you're just praying the devil out of? Oh, my. oh yeah. yeah. Right? You know what? Don't get discouraged. 
God knows your heart. He knows you're praying for your children or your brother or your sister or your mother or your father or your husband. He knows that. The worst thing you can do is get discouraged by not seeing what's going to happen. Because it will occur. The Bible says every knee, every knee, every knee will bow and confess Jesus as Lord. Every, hey, your loved ones don't have a chance. But don't get discouraged because you don't see things working fast as you like them to work. Some have been praying for family members for years. Amen? They might take a little bit of step this way just to kind of give us, oh man, this day, and then they take a step back. But God, let God accomplish what He wants to accomplish. He gives us assurance of rest. Rest for every inch of the way. Every, every mile that God has called us to, every step He's called us to, there is rest in it. If we know we are doing God's will, there is rest. Peace. Rest. And in every circumstance of life, there's rest. His presence gives us rest. His presence of the sun gives light. Just as the sun gives light, His presence gives us rest. You, have you ever grown fruit trees or uh, uh, grape vines or whatever else? If it wasn't for the life force inside of the, the, the stalk feeding the, the fruit leaves or whatever, if the sap of life isn't feeding, you're not going to get no fruit. And that's what God's doing to us. He's feeding us the sap of life by the power of the Spirit that produces a fruit. And that fruit sometimes just might be your joy. Might be the joy of the Lord that's upon you. You know what's better than that? The presence of a mother comforting her sick child. The presence of a mother picking her child up off the ground and scraping their knee or, or the presence of the child that has a, 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 a fever and the mother's just loving on it and taking care of it. That's what God does. If your mom ever lets you in a ditch, Like so many of our unborn children today, left to perish on the sideboard because mama didn't want them. God creates life for life to live. The Bible talks about Molech. The obstinate people took their newborn babies and stuck them in the fire to worship the God Molech. What's happening in America today? God wants to restore. God wants to show us how much He loves us. If we abide with Jesus, His rest will abide with us. If we will fear no evil, if we fear no evil because He is with us. Matthew 11, 28, write that down. His presence gives rest. His presence gives rest. Gives rest from the power of sin. From the fear of man. Gives us rest from the power of sin. From the fear of man. From the cares of the world. From the anxieties of service. Sometimes we get so full of anxiety. So full of doing what God wants us to do. That we that we get so unfamiliar. We get so so knocked off our, our, our self that we get anxiety and fear begins to settle in. We've been separated. He separated the, the Israelites. You've been separated from, from the things of the world. The presence of God with us by the Holy Spirit will separate us from the life and thoughts of the world. From the dominion of Satan. And the tyranny of self. How many of you know that self can be a pretty big problem? Yeah. Amen. Amen. His presence separates us. If we will not come out and be separated from the unclean, then we must part with the presence. If we can't come out and be separated from what is unclean, then we have to part with the presence of God. It's a choice, isn't it? It's a choice that we make. My family is going through absolute guru right now, Lord. Why is it happening? If they even say, Lord, why is it happening? 
My family's going through this. That we're, you know, this is happening and this is happening. We're arguing every day. And this is going on. This is going on. Why? And God will say this. Why aren't you in my presence? Why aren't you seeking my presence? Oh, I don't want to hear that. I want to hear good news. The good news is this. You seek me and you will find me. Because I'm not very far from you. No matter how far you get down the track, God will always welcome you in. Oh, I've been through so much. and You know, I've done this and I've done that. And the presence of God said, it's okay. I've taken care of that. We need to understand what the presence of God means in our lives. It means our neighbors can no longer dictate what we do. Our husbands, our wives, our sons, our daughters no longer dictate what we do. It's a shame when, when children begin to dictate to parents what they do and what they don't do. Yeah. I don't want to go there because they don't. Or I want to go there because they do. Amen? Amen. And you're going to do what I say because if you don't, I'm going to have a temper tantrum. <laughs> no? Yeah. And uh, I'm going to go out and get a big old wheeler switch, and we'll see who yeah. the tension lasts longer. That's right. <laughs> I, mean, I remember when my grandpa told us, you probably heard this before, my grandpa says, don't ride those goats. Well, okay. We went out and corralled them up and rode the goats. Pretty soon we looked up, and my grandfather had a hernia road bed, so he had to be stooped over all the time to put stuff back in place. We looked at him and our eyes got about this big around and I looked at my cousin Kenny and said, we're in trouble. Oops. He said, yep. Yeah. About that time, my grandfather, he used language that a sailor would, that a sailor would be like. <laughs> so he reached up and grabbed this. I'm not talking about a wheel stick. I'm talking about a branch that thing around. Ow. He reached up and grabbed that thing and he came after us. Good thing he couldn't run. But he said these words, if you don't stop, it's going to be worse. We got a woman. Did we ever ride the goats again? Nope. Yes. Yeah. You did? Yeah. Oh my gosh. We did. Yeah. We did. Well, did we get a beating again? Yeah. We did. But you see what I'm trying to say? If we don't if we don't do what God's asked us to do, don't expect him to save you. Amen? Another time my cousin and I were told not to sit on the saddles in the tack room. Yeah, right. And the reason why one, the reason why we come up with why you can't sit on the saddle of the tap room is because my grandfather would run a, a rope from the candle, wherever that thing is, and wrap it around the horn. And it would hang by the rafters. Uh, but we're on these things, we're swinging around, and my cousin's throwing me, I'm throwing him. That's a no-no. That's a no-no. And we yeah. broke a couple. Yeah. I won't tell you we yeah. did. Dude, that's expensive. And the switch was bigger. Yeah. Oh, I bet. And not only was the switch bigger, but now there's a whole bunch of groundings. Have you ever tried to rake an acre of, of, uh, of green with a rake? Have you ever tried to rake a field of wheat with just a rake? No. Have you ever tried to rake a field of hay with just a rake? What's the part of your punishment? My punishment. Our punishment. Wow. And you know what? I'm here to tell you that sunk in more deeper. Is that a word? More deeper? Yeah, deeper. Deep, 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 deep. That sunk in more yeah, deeper. Deep, more deeper. Than I can remember. Because every time I take a little swath of that rake, I look at that rake or that, that you draw a tractor or horse, whatever you're doing, and I wish that thing worked. And my first thought, let's go get on that thing. Oh, yeah. My cousin says, are you stupid? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're already raking a field. Look, you're already raking a field. Do you want to go up and you know wrestle steers? I mean, you're being dumb. Yeah. <laughs> so what my point in saying that was this. The presence of God will keep you from doing those things if you allow him to work in you. And don't let things or people control on how much you get into God. His presence wants to be with you everywhere. So his presence wants to give you a place of, of rest and completeness in his presence. His presence is a promise. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you for today. I know sometimes we can be a little bit over the top. But God, I think if we are over the top and giving you glory, I think that's okay. I thank you for your word today. I thank you that your promise of your word will not come back void. 
that everything that you said will come to happen. Everything that you said will come to pass. Even in our own lives, sometimes we look at loved ones and say, God, what are you going to do? And God says, I'm doing it. Sometimes we don't want to hear, take your hands off. But sometimes that's exactly what we need to hear and do. So this morning, God, I pray that your spirit will continue to go with us, nurture us, grow us. I pray, God, we get revelation from your word, no matter how simple it sounds or how majestic it sounds. Revelation is what keeps us. Revelation is what brings us to a place of knowledge in your presence. Go with us today, Lord, in your presence. We ask you, Father, today in your presence.